Hello, everybody. Welcome to another webinar of the Media Education Lab. I'm Yonti Frizem, the Executive Director of the Lab. Um, we're very excited about this new series that we're doing uh, because we're featuring work that our participants in the Media Ed Institute that was in uh, February, um, uh, what people came up with, what was helpful for them, and to show a variety of media literacy practices. Um, so the first one to volunteer is Erin James, and I'm so happy that um, she volunteered to um, uh, share with us her work. So Erin, I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, share your screen and take it away. Right. Great, so glad to be here. Hi, my name is Erin. Um, as Yancy said, I did the Media Ed Institute and I you know, graduated from that, certified media literacy educator. So that's really cool. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, a little bit about me. I have a background in children's entertainment. Actually, I come from the entertainment and animation world, which is partly why I'm so interested in media literacy, specifically for you know the younger ones from later elementary to middle school or middle grade age. It's an extremely formative time identity-wise, and it's really interesting age group to work with. So I volunteer with Girls Inc., which, if you're unfamiliar, is a nonprofit that works on development, um, be it educationally or you know self-esteem for girls, which is something I'm deeply interested in. And obviously, we spend a lot of time online, all of us, including kids. So being able to navigate that space is a critical skill to you know navigating the 21st century. And I've made a presentation that I did for a workshop for them, and I'm hoping to do another workshop for them. The first one went pretty well, and they were pleased with it. So <laughs> pretty happy to hear that. Okay. So let me just pull up the slideshow. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, cool. As you'll notice, it is <laughs> pretty bright, pretty nice, big primary colors, which is important when working with this age group because they will tune out very easily. So I like to make it bright and entertaining because as I said, I come from a children's entertainment background. So this one is called The Media That Makes Us. And the goal of this presentation is just to kind of have middle schoolers understand that why people have such visceral reactions to things that they see online and how it is part of building identity. So that's the first slide. We start with media text shape our identity. Um, I started out with things that kind of shaped my identity as a person just to kind of get the ball rolling. Here's some media text that I both grew up consuming and consume to this very day. Um, some cartoons. Like I said, I come from an animation background, so that was extremely influential to me and who I am as a person. Anyone you ask about me will say the same thing. Uh, here are some of my favorite influencers. This woman right here, I love her. I'm in a parasocial relationship with her. Her name is the Black Forager, and she goes around and she talks about foraging wild foods in and around the Americas, the United States. And I also am a nature educator. So that is really, really interesting to me. So it's good to just kind of be personal and talk about things that, you know, really are influential and, you know, integral to your life. Because on the next slide that we get to, what are some media texts that has shaped you? And this is one of the more engaging parts of this presentation. Um, at this point, I usually have the kids, however many there are, I have them kind of shout out, li literally shout out media texts and things that they've really enjoyed and that are kind of, you know, near and dear to their hearts. And they always, they really love this part. Um, last time I was working with this group of kids, it were... They were like sixth to eighth grade, all girls, mostly, you know, girls of color, black and Latina. And I got up in front of the board. I'm like, okay, let's just all just like pop off, give some examples. A lot of Disney things, a lot of movies, and they were very excited to share them. And then we just kind of had this giant, effectively word bubble of text that they all really enjoyed. And so that was cool. And we kind of got into a discussion like, why do you like this text? How important is it to you? It's like, do you feel, you know, a kinship or an identification 
with these characters? And usually the answer was yes. Most of the characters are kids about their age, girls going on adventures and, you know, kind of stuff to start hanging facets of your identity on. So it kind of underlines the idea that media, it is it is integral to who you are as a person and who you will grow up as, as a person and the stories that you tell yourself, which is extremely important at any age, but especially middle school. All right. This also kind of branches off the slide that we had before. How does consuming this media make us feel? And again, this was kind of a popcorn thing. I just had them kind of shout out ways that, they made, that it made them feel. We had a discussion. We wrote it on the board. Usually I got kind of the same responses. It made them feel happy or seen, entertained, obviously excited, but yeah. They were just things that kind of made their lives more, more colorful, more interesting, more fun. So all these media texts were deeply important near and dear to them. A lot of Disney texts, which I used to work not directly for Disney, but a company that was employed by Disney to make their content. That's exactly what they want. That is why they have such cultural hegemony because they are deeply ingrained into your core memories fun fact about disney hey okay and then i pose this question are our emotions wants or interests ever played on to sell us stuff or move us to action and i pose this question to the group there was a little bit of discussion some said yes some said no there were mostly yeses and then i go into this Yes, absolutely. No question. Yes. Because we had just spent so much time um, discussing how media texts are kind of integral to, you know, who you are as a person or complementary to who you are as a person and kind of the narratives you build around your stuff. That means that, you know, it's extremely influential in the texts that you read and see and engage with are extremely influential, which means that there are actors, players out there who could have a stake, who could have a huge stake, a huge vested interest in what you see and what you consume to these girls. That's how I pose that issue to these girls. Which brings us to the algorithm, burn, burn, burn. or in other words, how social media apps or you know youtube or anything you engage with online kind of decides what content that you see i kind of pose it to them as yeah this is not you know an inert thing it actually is pretty weighty because if you're consuming a lot of content that somebody else wants you to see you know it will inevitably end up influencing how you engage with and how you see the world. So uh kind of poses like this idea that, you know, there are consequences, there are stakes, there is a vested interest, which then brings us to kind of these weightier um, media literacy ideas. So we pose the idea that, you know, there are stakes to what you see which means somebody definitely has an interest in you know not con not controlling it's not not it's not that nefarious but you know influencing or monitoring or you know just being involved in what you see so it is a good idea to be aware of that and how do we navigate that well we think about think critically about what we see authors and audiences i ask them what can we guess about author intents and audience of things that we see online? Let's think about the context of where we see these things. Are we, are, this is like, uh, is it a casual conversation with our friends or are these ads that come up on our Instagram? Are they a lot like the ads that we already see? Are these things that make me feel good and, you know, align with how I already feel about the world? And in my opinion, one of the most important questions, can somebody profit or gain from my attention and how? Which is a question that, you know, you don't have to ask yourself that 24-7 when you're scrolling through social media because that is not how we consume things. But 
just something I tell them to like keep in the back of their mind, you know, just to kind of put it in perspective or not immediately absorb everything that you read online. All right, messages in meeting. What is the medium, which kind of ties back into, you know, the way in which we consume things. If the media is, you know, a quick infinite scroll platform, like, I guess they're all infinite scroll platforms now because it was so successful with TikTok that everybody now has reels. So yeah, what is the medium? Is the medium an infinite scroll reel where you only have a few seconds to absorb things? Or is it a book or is it, you know, a conversation with friends? That will definitely influence how, you know, you interpret this information. What values or perspectives are in this media? Which also does kind of loop back to what can we guess about author intent audience? Uh, oops. Effects it might have on people's opinions, beliefs, or behavior. So I kind of ask them like, hmm, when you see something like, is it feeding into things that you already watch? In which case, could this ad or, you know, this content doesn't possibly want us to believe more of what we're seeing? Is it forcing us in a certain direction? Or is it kind of an outlier in what we're seeing? In which case, why would that be? Just a good question to ask. All right. Representative reality. How is this a selective representation of reality? Which is another huge, big question to ask. So I asked them this, how is this selective representation of reality? Again, we discuss it a little bit. And the general idea that comes up is that nothing you read or see online is an objective representation of reality. It's just a perspective. It's constructed. It's always constructed because somebody made it and somebody made it with their perspective, which, you know, has its limitations, as does everyone. How are stereotypes and narrative views? And finally, what makes it seem trustworthy? Which is, again, a big question. What does make it seem trustworthy? Which I pose to them. Like, again, does it align with things that we're already seeing online? Is it said by people we trust? And then that kind of begs the question, well, why do you trust these people? And that feeds back into our original thing. Well, because again, online, it's all very tied up in our identity and things that make us feel good, you know? So it probably seems trustworthy if it comes from a source or someone adjacent to media that you're already consuming because it's effectively kind of a part of you. These are the things that make up your worldview, your identity. So yeah, it will seem trustworthy if it aligns with that. But like we said, can someone profit or gain from my attention? That is something to keep in mind. So that's a lot of talking. This is usually where, you know, the energy kind of starts to drop a little in the presentation, but it's important because it goes into our next thing, which is game time. So they're kids. They like to play games. One thing I did notice, um, I made an assumption before I went into this that all of them would have devices and would be have their devices at the ready, which was not always the case. Because at this age, a lot of parents still don't want them to be on the phone all the time. Maybe they don't have phones. Maybe there's, you know, a financial component to it. Like they don't all have devices. And sometimes you're at schools where not everybody has a device, you know, or not every kid gets a laptop, which is fine. Uh, and anyways, sometimes it's nice just to play games, you know, in real life because it's active and, you know, sometimes people don't want their kids making things and just sending it out into the internet where anything can happen to it, which is fine. Can you, can you just before, um, talk a little bit like, so what did you do? Like, yeah, yeah. You were planning so, that everybody would have a device and then suddenly you're coming in the class and, uh, and the, no. So, yeah. What? So this is, uh, I planned, I forget, I didn't plan for them. I had, uh, I had originally thought that they all had devices, but then when I realized they didn't, the game that I had planned is I had to make it like an in real life type of thing. So I set up a bunch of scenarios and I kind of had them split up into groups of two or, you know, two or three. And I made little slips of paper and I was like, okay, everyone's going to pick like, an author that you are, a medium that you're using, 
and the objective of somebody in this medium. So let's say they picked candidate for student body president. You're making a YouTube short and your objective is to, you know, get somebody to buy a product or get somebody to vote for a certain student body president. And I split them all up into groups. And I was like, okay, now why don't you go ahead and make kind of like a scene where you're this author and you're trying to convince somebody of this objective. And they all had a really good time. It was fun. <laughs> they liked making their little improv scenes. And then afterwards, after every scene, um, I kind of brought them all together and I'm like, okay, let's discuss uh, what we saw and how can we how can we link that back to, whoops, how can we link that back to these, you know, critical tenets of media literacy. So what can we guess about the author? Like what author, you know, what was this person? Who was this person making this content? And medium, that is a little more difficult to do without a device, but it's still kind of, it's still kind of hit. Just, you know, you have to speak in internet terms and short, snappy sentences. So it did, they're all familiar with the medium. So it did kind of mirror the medium. What are the values, our perspectives in this media? Um, and also you can make this, you can tweak this, you can make it as detailed or as not as you want, or I'm, you know, I'm gonna go back to the school and hopefully present again. And it would be nice to have the student input for, oops, wrong way, wrong way. It would be nice to have the student input for these scenarios, like, cause I am from the outside looking in, so I can only, um, I can only guess so much like the types of content and players that they're engaging with. So it's nice to have as much student input as you possibly can. Like, what do you see when you're online and what type of authorship things do you see? So you can list one of those as one of the authors. Yeah. And so we ask them, you know, who is the author who is making this? And then also, what do you think they're perspectives are and then the most important question to me how is this a selective representation because in my humble opinion that is where one can really get lost on the internet and going through social media like you know you can compare yourself really easily to people which is a big thing in middle school but it's a selective representation it's not everything it's just one little slice it's not entirely who you are, but if you're very online like I am, it's easy to get lost in that. <laughs> so yeah, I have them go through these little scenes and then I ask them, you know, kind of more critical questions about all of their little presentations that they made. And then after we do this for, I don't know, maybe 20 or so minutes or however long it takes to get through all these, they're pretty, you know, they've had a lot of fun. They're pretty, you know, jazzed about media literacy, which is cool. And then I pose the question, what can we do in our real lives? We can, number one, recognize trolls and bad actors and do not respond to these people because they are not worth your time and energy. And because of the aforementioned algorithm, it is a dumb machine. <laughs> it does not, you know, it does not understand that when things are bad, it just understands how much people engage with something and it will regurgitate it back to you based on clicks and interests. And then of course, you are always free to create your own media and narrative, which is part of the give and take of social media. That's what makes it so, so fun and so, so cool. You get to create whatever you want and inevitably you will probably find people who will vibe with what you're saying. I'm I'm wondering if the students were sharing with you, like, mm -hmm. um, for example, troll that they did answer and it went really bad because they answered, or when they retake agency over their own narrative, and how was there stories that were shared or you were sharing with them? Uh, sorry. So you're asking um, if I had any stories. Examples about that they were sharing with you. Oh, I had this troll on, you know, Instagram that would blah, blah, blah. And then they were sharing like a story that happened to them. Like, hmm. I didn't get too deep into whether they themselves um, encountered any trolls just because I didn't want to cry too much into, you know, their personal online lives mm -hmm. in case. Because I don't really know, like, 
I'm assuming in my mind that if they did encounter trolls or bullies, it would be a relatively tame thing. But I mm. also don't know because sometimes people can be really, really mean on the internet. And I didn't really want them to mm. hash that out if they didn't want to in front of me. But you know what? That's a cool idea. And I might incorporate that into the next time I give this presentation. But yeah. Uh, but I did say that you can create your own media and narrative. And then I showed just some examples of girls their age and the amazing things that they can do, the amazing narratives that they can create. Um, this is a, well, it's a now defunct blog. It's called Rookie Mag, but it's really cool. And the girl who started it, she was about maybe 14 when she started, when she started it. And she just collected all these, all this art and all these stories from, you know, teenage girls and it became a pretty big sensation and the girl who started it she went on to have a illustrious career in entertainment but it was neat and how it kind of broke up a lot of the for lack of a better term social media slime that you sometimes get longer form pieces that kind of disrupt like the quick rapid you know form of tiktok and instagram which is a cool way to disrupt you know and create a new narrative Create your own media. You're a cultural gem generator and your voice is invaluable. And that was that was the presentation <laughs> that I gave for these kids. And it went pretty well. And they want me back. So <laughs> super yeah. cool. So I before I have like questions and stuff, and I ask already several questions. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if if Carmen or uh, Anastasia, you have any questions for Aaron? Um, Sorry, um, I had to move to my storage room. My kids came back, so <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I just, I just, I really like this. Um, hold on, I don't know if you need to see me or not, but anyway, yeah. you can um, stop I sharing, Aaron. So oh, cool. Awesome. But um, I, I really like this. In fact, um, it ties into um, the literature, um, the text that we're reading right now. And that's our essential question is, you know, how is uh, modern technology helpful or harmful to our society? And so we've been having these discussions and this is a great, you know, way to incorporate some of those questions and get them engaged in talking. I, I, I really like it. I was already have some things buzzing in like, I would like to like have them vote. I can't remember the app. You know how when they vote in that one section where how has it shaped you where they could type in and then the answers get bigger and bigger. I don't remember what they are, but anyway, I, I thought that would be cool to see their responses so they can get a visual of that. Um, that whole um, responsibility about, you know, um, being a responsible person using technology and how can we make this a, a better world and and uh, you know, don't you know? Actions speak louder than words. So we've been having these types of discussions, and I, I really like this. So thank you. I just um, uh, um, I enjoyed it very much. I've been writing and taking down a bunch of notes as we've been listening. So, so thank you very much. That's so, all I wanted to say. I'm I'm wondering, Carmen, like, uh, how would you use it? Like, because obviously you have a different um, um you know, audience than uh, Aaron had in LA and like, how would you use this kind of practices in your classroom? Well, like I said, um, I, I like the whole intro. I would probably use it as a sort of uh, introduction first to technology, you know, getting the, those conversations going. Um, I would use it, um, you know, just throughout and just keep going back to the different um, the, the different slides and, and get those, to get them engaged and have that discussion. Um, a lot of times here on the reservation, our, our technology isn't the greatest. Our Wi-Fi is sometimes can be sketchy. And it, um, it's hard for us, you know, to do a whole lot with technology, but like, um, I'm, that's, I, you know, I would just use it throughout this whole, um, I would try to not use it just, like I said, it ties in right now with the literature, um, the text that we're reading. But um, I would try to use it throughout the whole year. I mean, I think this is something that's ongoing if we have, I want them to be um, better digital learners, if you will. Um, and I'm, I'm at that point too. 
um, there's a whole lot. I, I'm still uh, like a newbie. I try things and, you know, then I, I think sometimes I try too many things, but I, I like this as a small start for me to get going. I would um, definitely bring this up in this section of where I'm at right now in my lesson, but I would like to use it for the whole year, you know, something ongoing. Definitely. Cool. That's great. I, I was asking about New Mexico because I worked in Taos uh -huh. uh, for several years and we did a lot of experiments and it's good for the, the students to see that you're also experimenting because you're mm -hmm. teaching them to explore and to do inquiry. So that's it's, awesome. Exactly. And um, it's uh, they know so much more than I do. You know, I'm always asking them. So they, they're in turn teaching me as well. So um, but I, I really enjoy this. I really I'm it's something I definitely will want to use. Thank you so much, Aaron. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Aaron, thinking about what Carmen just said, what mm -hmm. what did you learn from the um, from the students you presented this to? Like, was there something new that they were sharing with you that you were like, "Oh, interesting." Hmm. I'm trying to think. I was just so like mm -hmm. in the zone, like, "Oh, I gotta do this presentation right." <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I thought, um, I guess I just had, I realized that I had a lot of assumptions about <laughs> kids and young people that, mm -hmm. again, were just kind of based on things that I'd, you know, just seen online as opposed to having actual conversation with kids. And they are online a lot, but their lives like aren't entirely online. And also um, just that some of them actually aren't on social media all that that much or aren't as you know incredibly well versed as I immediately would have thought that they'd be on social media so a lot of them have just never asked these questions or really ever thought about media literacy at all they were just like oh these are just things that I consume and it was it was interesting yeah that's that's an interesting so you're saying like for the next stage so what are what are your plans like where where are you going to take it I want to take it into more middle schools, hopefully, and I would like to have, I would like to somehow figure out how to have, um, how to have like a more online component to it, because it is kind of about media literacy. While I do like doing the, the in real life um, mm -hmm. scenes, it would be really cool just to somehow figure out how I could take one laptop, one projector and somehow make that um make that a little bit more expansive for a group of kids, hopefully have them all participate in creating a text or maybe even like a small documentary or video that they put up on a website. That would be really neat. Uh, that might require a little bit more school cooperation, but yeah, that's what I'd like to do with it next. Have them all kind of talk about media mm -hmm. literacy and media just in longer form. Cool. I have just a, a quick uh, follow up question. Um, mm -hmm. Nice presentation, by the way. Um, I enjoyed listening, following through. Um, so you, you talk about um, in the future, trying to be more practical in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, kind of, I, I come from a different, um, say, setting from the US. I, I grew up in Tanzania and now I'm living in Belgium. So I kind of have the best, the best of two different worlds already. And I'm wondering, do you did you first come across like um, some of the students who you felt that they were a bit behind, or what was the level like between the students? And uh, maybe from my perspective, I would assume that there are those who are more cognizant with what's going on. You know, if you tell them, maybe perhaps they already know about a logarithm and stuff like this about trolls. Did you also come across students who say, okay, I've never heard about trolls or Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. I use a phone, but I, I have no clue what's going on. And then second question, it would be that if you're planning to incorporate practical aspect in the future, I mean, how would you approach it? Because you want at the end of the day, if you're saying you're going to just go or, um, have a laptop and set up and then kind of take it from there, um, how do you ensure that all students will equally participate and, you know, learn and you know, get out something out of it. Because um if I can give an example of where I come from in Tanzania, you you go to a, if you if you would choose to make a media literacy class there, eh, this would be one of the challenges that you will come across that there is disparity between 
how much the students know. You know, you have students coming from certain backgrounds that are more privileged and those that are not so privileged. They probably have never held a smartphone in their lives. Just an example. And um, yeah, and you would have some that probably they already have um, these devices that you, you mentioned that you thought that the students had come with devices in class, but you found out that their parents were strict about that. But you, you know, please um, explain to me um, how was the situation? I'm, I'm curious to know. Yeah, absolutely. So, so your first question, um, where some of them at different um, levels of understanding, just kind of different facets of, you know, being online, they were all pretty much at the same level for here, just because, um, and again, I'm just assuming, but most of them, if they didn't have a phone or device, like they had a friend who had a phone or device or like somebody adjacent to them. So, and also even if they didn't have a phone or a device, like they still have access to laptops or computers. So they were still familiar with the concept of like an online bully, even if they didn't immediately call it like a troll. Um, if I had to go back, I would maybe um, maybe have like a glossary or just kind of a basic like a basic dictionary glossary or just kind of a little little prep course about you know just basic things on the internet just like here's what a troll is like just kind of basic terms and everything just to make sure that we're all on the same page just so I don't assume as for kind of the technology you know maybe disparity between some of the students Within the groups that I've been working with, just because in Los Angeles, like if they're within the same middle school, like the kids at within these schools are probably going to have access to relatively the same technology. But if it is an, if it is a place where maybe some of them have a little bit more access to technology than the other ones, um, like I said, I like doing the in person kind of acting improv things because that's something that anybody can do or you know, I could bring in my own individual laptop or phone and record them with the school's permission, of course, because that is another thing, like, you have to get permission from the school to record kids and post it online. Absolutely. I can't, I can't just go in and do that. So yeah, just bringing in my own equipment, if that's like feasible and also setting up a website, doing anything online, like that's something they're all really engaged with. And so I kind of let them come up to the laptop and take turns. And then I kind of ask them like, while one person's at the laptop, like, what should we do? What are we going to do? And then I'll, while one person's at the laptop, I'll write ideas on the board. And then I'll just kind of have the person at the laptop, you know, take the wheel and run it for a minute and they're all really excited to get that turn so I think that kind of is what keeps them engaged also but the group that I worked with they met regularly so they're all kind of friends so that definitely was a factor because they all knew each other they were all you know invested in what everybody else was doing so I would say if you have a group of kids that you're seeing regularly just to also have like team activities so that they're invested in what each other does so even if they can't immediately work on like the laptop or the technology because you know they all kind of like each other and they're invested in what each other's doing that does make them a little bit more interested in what's going on does that answer your question I'm sorry does that is that uh, yeah 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 it does thank you cool awesome thank Anybody? you so um my my last question is um relating to the the media ed institute like in in what way that you know it was 6 weeks and there were different speakers and there were the um micro credential like uh i can see some things in your presentation uh but i'm wondering from your perspective what do you see that it contributed to it what in those 6 weeks uh was helping for you to create this experience and, and building it? Yeah, so obviously a lot of my slides are not completely lifted, but heavily inspired by some of the courses that we took. I would definitely say the one thing that was, the one course we took that was most influential to me was, um, it was kind of media and joy. And, you know, that's 
a lot of what I built this off of just why why media you know why why is it so powerful why is it so influential which to me is definitely at the heart of media literacy because why even bother with media literacy at all because you know or any type of literacy for that matter because it's important you know it it is literally it mediates you and your experience of the world and just seeing that that kind of meet to me was an overarching theme of the media ed institute and it was really fascinating and just the idea of you know media creating joy and media just being integral to who you are like I thought that was just so relevant to a kid a child's life and just you know really important it's something I wanted to be a part of and help facilitate and yeah um what else I also took the micro credential course uh understanding conspiracy theories so that is a very different tone from the type of thing that I presented, but it does it does tie in there in the sense of like, what do you believe? Like, what is this perspective? And it did kind of tie into this idea of what you engage with is what you will get more of. And that's, you know, that's what you'll start to believe. You keep seeing it over and over and over and how other people kind of lock on to things a really interesting idea to that was um conspiracy theories are really prevalent in times of turmoil and unrest which as i understand it is a recurring theme for gen z and so when you're in kind of situations or times like that it's okay. easy to create a narrative so of like right. a villain yeah. and, and then you're you know, you, a good them. person whose ideas are always right so that idea of media being a selective representation of reality. I think that's important. If I could go back, that would, that's one thing I would also stress a little bit more in the presentation that I made, selective reality, which is to say, you know, no one's absolutely right, you know, when you're looking at things on media. That's why you need to engage with it because, you know, you yourself have biases in places that, you know, perspectives and places that you come from that color your judgment. And if left unchecked, it could lead to things that are personally bad and also bad for, oh, I don't know, a body politic. So I thought that was really interesting for about the conspiracy theories. Does that does that answer that question? Yeah, I know Wes will be thrilled to hear you. So uh, yeah, I really yeah. like that course. It was great. <laughs> Yes. Awesome. So any any closing remark, concluding remarks, like from your experience into, you know, um, the future of work that you want to do and some suggestion for others or anything that you're you want to share? Yeah. So I super duper enjoyed making this presentation. I love working with that age group, they were super fun and entertaining. Um, uh, what I would suggest, I would I would go in with maybe a tiny bit more structure than I did, like have more, you know, pointed discussion questions, but also strike that balance of pointed discussion questions and activities because I can feel the energy being sucked from the room as I'm like talking to them a little bit too much. So not that there's any golden ratio, but maybe like, you know, like a good 15 minutes of talking and then a good 10 minutes of games. So yeah, whatever you talk about, put it into, put it into discussion. And if you can find like a really good media literacy based video game, that also eats time and keeps them engaged. Like I have yet, there were some good ones, but I've yet to find ones that were really like like really engaging for that middle school age group because they're just they're so critical of everything oh, yeah. everything is cringe to them yes. so if you find one definitely let me know and yeah just always ask them questions first and put their perspective and lives first because that'll be the most interesting thing and what you get the most meat and bang for your buck out of yeah and it's yeah. it's part of experience, right? Like how long you'll be in the classroom and do it, and you get more and more. And and there's a lot of video games, 
claim to be media literacy games, but it's not necessarily, you know, working in the class the way mm -hmm. that you want it to, to work. Um, yeah. Great. Um, I don't know if any of the participants had any more questions for Erin. I don't have any questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. So again, Erin, awesome. I'm so glad. Ah, Carmen, do you have any? No, I was just going to comment that I didn't have any questions as well. But thank okay. you again. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm so glad that um, you took the time to share with us uh, the, the journey from the Media Ed Institute into the classroom and the challenges, but also the benefits of how your presentation was helping the middle schoolers engage and be thoughtful about their media use. So I hear a lot of interesting new project that we're going to definitely discuss. Uh, and, and people are always welcome to come and share. So again, thank you everybody for being part of uh, another webinar, the Media Education Lab. Thank you. Thank you so much for seeing my thank presentation. You.